So yes, it is Wednesday night, and that means it's time for our Wednesday, Wednesday night faith lift. Amen, amen, amen. Man, I'll tell you what, if we can't get excited over the Word of God, there's really not a whole lot to get excited about. Amen, because heaven and earth are passing away, but the Word of God will never pass away. And it seems like the older I get, I'm looking for a sure foundation. I'm looking for something stable and solid to stand upon. And I'll tell you, that's real important, no matter what your age is. But over in Matthew's Gospel, that's where we'll, uh, we'll go tonight, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. So you want to find your way over to Matthew, chapter 14. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And the New Testament starts off with the... Uh, uh, Gospels according to St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? So we're starting here this evening in Matthew 14. I do not know where we're going to end up, but God knows. So let's just stay engaged and connected, and we'll get there together, all right? So we're going to pick up a story here in the 14th chapter of Matthew just after um, John the Baptist is beheaded. Um, he was beheaded, not, not a very... A pleasant experience, especially for his cousin Jesus. You know that they are, uh, were cousins. I guess you can say they still are, really. Just that neither one of them lives on the earth right now. Uh, but uh, so we're going to pick up the story right after the death of John the Baptist. And it says here uh, in verse 12, so this is Matthew 14, 12. And his disciples came and took up the body, buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. Okay, Matthew 14, now verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he flew into a rage and called down the fire of God and he smote everyone involved. He went on a bloody rampage. No, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. In other words, he wanted to get alone after hearing the news, this tragic news, he wanted to go be alone. Okay, and then it says, when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And he chastised them. And he rebuked them and said, leave me alone. I need my time. I need my private time. No, I'm not reading from the same Bible, evidently. <laughs> no, in verse 14, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. He healed their sick. Now, don't think for one moment that Jesus was not grieving. Of course he was. He operated as a man, anointed by the Spirit of God. Right? The Bible says that Jesus emptied himself of divine rights and privileges when he walked among us and, and he lived as a man, so you know that he was feeling uh, grief. Who knows what other emotions were going, going on, right? You can just imagine those of you, and those of us who have lost, lost people that we love. So he wants to go be alone. The people followed him. They went out of the city. And he healed their sick. And then in verse 15, when, evening, uh, when it was evening, his disciples, they came to him and they said, this is a desert place. The time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. In other words, hey, Lord, it's getting late. This place is really remote where we're at. There are no McDonald's or Taco Bells. Send them away so that they can go back into the towns and go buy themselves some food. Okay? Pretty simple. Verse 16, Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give them something to eat. In verse 17, they say unto him, we only have five loaves and two fish. We only have five loaves of bread, and it was Italian bread, absolutely, and two fish. Now you pick whatever fish you want it to be. Five loaves and two fish. In verse 18, Jesus said, bring them hither to me. Hmm, what's he getting ready to do now? He commanded the multitude, in verse 19, to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. 
the New Living Translation said he broke the loaves into pieces. And in verse 20, they did all eat and were filled. They all ate as much as they wanted. They were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, ate until they were full from five loaves of bread and two fish. I would consider that a miracle. And the disciples were a part of it. The disciples said, we only got five loaves and two fish. What are we going to do with this, Lord? Bring them to me. Just bring what you have to me. Just use what you have. It may not seem like a whole lot. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, it really, it does seem that way oftentimes. You know, the need is so great, Lord. What can I do? The need is so great, it almost, at times, it's almost overwhelming. What can I do? Just do what you can do. Start where you are. Do what you can with what you have. Glory be to God. Now keep in mind, the disciples had just experienced this. They just experienced this. This is a miracle. You cannot feed 5,000 men and then add the women and children on top of that. You can't feed them with five loaves and two fish. That's an impossibility. He took the loaves, broke them into pieces. Can you imagine? He, takes, he breaks these loaves and he just gives each disciple a piece. Okay, start distributing. How far is this going to go? Let me take a little crumb here for you, sir. Miss, here's a little crumb for you. Here's your kitties. Here's a few crumbs for you. If, 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 if we do it right, everybody can get maybe a crumb. Well, that's not what the Bible says. They ate until they were full. But see, things didn't start happening until they took the piece that Jesus gave them and started distributing. So this is a miracle. This is hands-on. This is not word of mouth, well, I heard that this happened 385,000 years ago. No, these disciples are actually taking a part in this miracle. This is a hands-on miracle. Now, I'm taking the time to build you up with this for a reason. There's no mistaking this. Whichever disciples were a part of this, and we assume, let's just assume it was the 12. We can assume that, right? So let's just assume that his 12 disciples were actively participating in this just by giving him those five loaves and two fish. So they saw what was going on. It's like, hey, uh, hey, uh, this piece of bread isn't running out. How, how, how about yours? Yeah, mine too. How about your fish over there? Ah, man, it just, it just it's, I don't know. It just keeps, it, it never ends. It's the never-ending fish and the never-ending loaf of bread here. Hmm. Verse 22, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. Remember, it was late. And when, verse 23, he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Remember what he went to go do, right? He went to go be alone after John the Baptist was beheaded. Yeah, but it's... It's late now. Jesus should really try to get some rest. Well, no, I still need to pray. Yeah, but I'm tired. I've been working real hard for you, Lord. You know, I'll catch up with you later. Well, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. I wonder how long it took him to disperse thousands of people. It took about three minutes. Probably not. Probably not. When the evening was come, he was there alone. Okay, that's what he went to do, was to spend some alone time. I, I wonder how often you go to spend some alone time and you get interrupted. I wonder how often you get interrupted and you look at it and think, man, ministry would be amazing if it weren't for the people that keep interrupting me. Ah, uh, amen. I got an amen, an enthusiastic amen. 
See, we've got to keep the focus. We have to keep the focus. We must keep the perspective that ministry is and will always be about people. And you know what? You're going to get tired. You're going to go try to spend some alone time and it's going to get interrupted. Well, deal with it. Make sure, though, that you don't blow through your private time. Make sure you still make the time. And in verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, this is between 3 and 6 a.m. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Well, you can't blame them for that, can you? It's not normal to see a person walking on the water. And I can just imagine between 3 and 6 a.m., you're probably feeling a little bit sleepy, a little bit hazy, a little bit fuzzy. But straightway in verse 27, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Ah! And Peter answered him, and he said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Well, yeah, I had just been a part of this miracle of feeding this crowd with five loaves and two fish. It's amazing when you hang around Jesus, it's amazing what starts happening. You transcend all limits and boundaries. In fact, he suspends the laws of nature to be a blessing to people. The laws of this world, the laws of this, of this universe are suspended. When you hang around the Lord Jesus, he does amazing things to bless people, to meet their needs, to satisfy them, to help them. Those people were hungry, and they ate until they were full. And then Jesus himself dismisses them. I still, that boggles my mind because I'm thinking, man, I would have passed out on the cot or on the ground. I would have been so tired and worn out and still upset about hearing about John getting uh, beheaded. And Jesus simply said, come. And Peter said, hot diggity dog, man. He threw his leg over. Put his, put his leg out, put his foot on the water, and it didn't go, it didn't push through. And he said, well, here comes the other one. Boom, and now he's standing on the water. And now the Bible says he walked on the water too. Here's my question. After being a part of this miracle, and this isn't the only miracle they'd been a part of up to this point, you would have thought the other disciples would have jumped on out too. Like, wow, man, this is cool. When is this ever going to happen again? I want to be able to tell all my friends, guess what I did last night? I want bragging rights. I am sure, based upon that one word, come, they all could have jumped out of the boat and walked on the water too. But nobody did even after actively participating in this miracle of feeding the crowds. Now, I'm wondering what happens after you witness a miracle, after you actively participate in a miracle. Maybe you've been the recipient of a miracle. I'm kind of wondering what happens to your faith when, verse 30 happens, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. How many times are we at an all, we're at an all-time high with our faith, and then all of a sudden, we start looking around at the natural circumstances, even though we just received a miracle or participated in one, we've witnessed what, maybe we got all stirred up in church, maybe we got all excited, I don't know, anything, just fill in the blank for your own life, and then all of a sudden, you look around at the circumstances and, ah, I can't do this, you can't walk on water. And the Bible says he began to sink immediately. This started happening. I mean, one step, one step into fear is a step out of faith, isn't it? 
You start looking around at circumstances. You start considering the natural things around you. What starts happening? Yeah, you lose your faith. You let go of faith. And thank God for, for verse, 30, verse 31. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and he said unto him, I am so sorry, Peter. I never should have left you alone for one moment to do the impossible because nobody has ever done this before. And I guess my expectation was a little bit unfair, Peter. Can you forgive me? No, he said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Come on, man. He didn't even give Peter a break. No, you're not going to get a break here, folks. You're not going to get a break. The Bible's very clear that the just shall live by faith. In fact, it says the exact same thing four times. Habakkuk, uh, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, and the, there's one other place. Uh, it's, it says four times the just shall live by faith. You're not exempt from that. You don't get a free pass. You don't get to circumvent that. In other words, you must Put it in your mind that you're going to do this by faith. There is no other option for you. Well, here's the beautiful thing is that faith, faith pushes beyond the limits of the natural realm. Faith goes beyond the limitations that are set, doesn't it? People don't walk on the water unless it's frozen. But yet we have an example right here. Jesus did it. And Peter said, well, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, well, come on. Ain't no big thing. Oh, all right. I mean, I am, I am amazed that Peter actually walked on the water. Peter succeeded in walking on the water. But Peter also failed as well because he took his eyes off of Jesus. He took his eyes off the promise and he put his eyes back on the natural limitations he put his eyes back on the, the doctor's report. He put his eyes back on the bank statement. He put his eyes back on the cupboard or back on, you just fill in the blank, whatever you're going through in your life. Four references. Okay. So in other words, there is no option for us. The just shall live by faith. But then there's another passage of scripture that says, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so Peter made the fatal error, didn't he? He took his eyes off of the Lord Jesus, which is letting go of faith, and he put his eyes on natural circumstances and lost the victory. So, yes, he succeeded. Praise the Lord, he did, but he also failed. How many times have you succeeded in something and you thought, man, this faith thing is working for me? Glory to God. But then all of a sudden, you lose the victory. It happens, doesn't it? It happens. And, and the key is, don't quit. See, a lot of times people say, ah, this doesn't work. How many times I've heard some smart Alex say, oh, you know, I've tried this faith thing before. Well, it doesn't work for those who try it. You have to do it. You don't try it. You've got to live this thing. You got to work it. It works for whoever works it. You have to work it. You have to live it. You have to walk it. If one step in faith kept you on top of the water, then that same faith would have kept a hundred steps on top of the water. I have no doubt he could have stayed right on there and just kept walking with Jesus and the rest of them could have come out of the boat as well. Thank God. He said, you have little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Well, yeah, no, duh. No, duh. And we can and we do suspend the limits of this world, the laws of nature. We suspend these laws to be a blessing to humanity because that's the heart of God. Faith will do that for you. Faith will do that for you. But if you insist on doing it your way, and your way meaning the way according to the sight realm, the laws of nature, science, and so forth, uh, then you have just taken the miraculous out of the equation. 
Peter succeeded in walking on the water and he also failed. And the difference is where he was looking. So what, it, what is it that you are experiencing right now? And then, then, then ask yourself, well, where am I looking? Well, I'm looking at the symptoms. I'm looking at the report. I'm looking at the lack. I'm looking at the, well, see, you're looking in the wrong place. Something else of importance is that there really is a big difference between faith and folly. You know, it's just plain foolishness for somebody to just jump out of the boat and say, oh, I'm going to try this too. Well, if you have the word of God and you step out, that's called faith. If you find a scripture that promises you something, and Jesus said, come, so that's good enough. But if you have a word, if you have a promise, and you step out on that and you stand on it, no matter what the weather is doing spiritually, whatever the spiritual climate is doing, regardless of how bad it looks, you're standing on the word, and that's called faith. Now, if you don't have a promise and you're just doing it because you felt inspired and you did it, and you don't even know why you did it, that might be called foolishness. Or maybe because Jeffy boy over there decided he was going to do it. Well, if Jeffy can do it, I can do it. Well, I wouldn't do it because Jeffy boy's doing it. I would do it because the word of God says to do it. Huh. You know, sometimes things happen supernaturally and people get healed. And, and, uh, and, and, and so somebody looks and says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit taking my medication too. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You don't quit taking your medication unless you and God got this thing worked out already. Well, I'm going to do it because Cuthbert did it. Well, maybe him and God had it worked out, but you don't do it just because he did it. There's a difference between faith and foolishness. In fact, someone once wrote a book called uh, Faith, Foolishness, and Presumption. I think it was called something to that effect. But there's a big difference, and you need to know the difference. Faith will step out with the word of God under its feet. Folly just does it because. Well, somebody's saying, well, I'm believing God for such and such. What scripture are you standing upon? What do you base that on? Oh, I don't have a scripture. I got the Holy Ghost, man. I just felt the Holy Ghost all over me. And I just felt like this is what I was going to do. Well, no, no, you, you have to have a sure foundation. Something else, if, if you are walking one step by faith, then there's no other way for you to walk the rest of the way. You got to do it by faith. You got to, you've got to do it by faith. Otherwise, you limit yourself. Jesus had made a statement when uh, his disciples weren't able to help this boy that had a spirit and uh, they weren't able to help him. So, so uh, when they came to Jesus and asked for help, he, he took care of the problem and, and he actually rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. But, you know, Jesus uh, said, uh, you know, nothing is impossible if you believe. It's not a matter of whether I can do anything. Because that's what they said, Lord, if you can do anything, please help us. Not a matter what I can do. But can you believe? Because if you can believe, all things are possible. And so this is where we've got to come to in our faith journey, is that we have to know this, that everything, 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 and anything is possible. No exceptions. The question is, can you believe? Because that's what Jesus said. Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Well, come on then. Jesus didn't say, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 I'm Jesus and you're not. You stay in the boat. No, no, no. I can do this because I'm the son of God. You're just Peter. You stay there. No, it was just simple come. And see, as I read my Bibles and I go, and, and I go through the books of the, of the New Testament specifically, when I get over into the book of Acts and I see the beginning of the spirit-filled church, which you and I are a part of, and I see the things that are being done in the book of Acts, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. What about us today? Oh, no, no, no. You stay in the boat. That was for them. This isn't for you. That's baloney, folks. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is absolutely baloney when somebody says, oh, no, no, that was for first century Christians. It's not for us. We're advanced now. No, see, that's not the way this thing works. Jesus didn't put that in the Bible. He said, if you can believe... He said, if you believe, you're going to do the same things that I do, uh, except the Christians that are living in the year 2019. It hasn't changed. Our faith level is different. 
We have more faith in... Ew, I'm not going to say it because I'm going to hurt somebody's feeling. <laughs> we have more faith in other things. Here's the thing. We've got too many options. We've got way too many options today. Yeah, I mean, you know, seriously, I, I'm just joking here. We were talking about uh, uh, frozen pizzas up at the grocery store uh, in, there in Rockford. Woodman's. Have you ever been to Woodman's and see the frozen pizza selection? I, it's like, what the heck? 60 different varieties of frozen pizza. Like, what? Is that nuts or what? No wonder why people are so fickle and they're just like, well, you know, people are, we were spoiled, aren't we? We are absolutely spoiled. And the problem is when it comes to the things of God and the things of faith, when we reach the end of all other options, well, let me try God. Too late. <laughs> Party over at a time, usually. How about we make him the first option? How about we give him the due diligence that we would in pursuing the answer elsewhere? I'm just saying, folks, I'm not, t I'm not telling you what to do. That's your business. I'm just telling you that based upon my years, I'm just talking 25 years of pastoral experience, not even total ministry. People sometimes, they wait too long. Well, the doctor's given up. Medical science can't help me. There are no other options. Ah, what well, can, can prayer hurt? I, I, I need all the prayer I can get now. When people say that, I think, why even bother? Yeah, lip service. So, keep in mind, keep in mind that nothing is impossible. It really does matter where your focus is. If you focus on the symptoms, if you focus on the problem, if you focus on the natural things, uh, you are limiting yourself. God's not going to force you to trust him. The same way the Lord did not force Peter out of the boat. He just said, well, come on. Peter jumped out, well, let's do this thing. Fine, let's go. It was Peter who took his eyes off of the Lord and started looking around. So you might need to put your focus back on the Lord. And one of the best ways to do that, and this is just real practical as we, as we close, one of the best ways to do that is to get into this book. If you have to, close out the world and read that passage of scripture that you need over and over and over until it runs out of your ears, until it runs out of your eyeballs because you're so full of it. Stay in that. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't take in massive amounts of the word anymore. I just take small bite-sized pieces and I go over them and over them and over them and over them until it gets down in me. So that when the winds blow and the storm comes, Guess, guess what comes up? Recall this. Amen. And amen. Well, let's pray. So, Father, we want to thank you that nothing is impossible. For those of us who believe, you said it's not impossible. So we say it's not impossible. And we choose to keep our focus on you. We choose to keep our eyes upon you, Lord God, and we will not short-circuit the power of God. We will not shut down our miracle because nothing is impossible. And Lord, I thank you that you are looking to suspend the laws of nature on our behalf, that you are looking to move heaven and hell on our behalf, Lord, to bless us and to help us and to sustain us and to satisfy us. And Father, I pray that you help us to align ourselves with your program. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. <laughs>